How are you doing today? My name is Kayla Troop, and this is Where Are They Now for Detroit Hot Radio in conjunction with Detroit Hot Television. So on today's episode, we have an artist who has captured the hearts of many with his smooth jazz melodies and funky, soulful renditions. He has completed eight solo projects, 21 chart-topping Billboard singles, four Billboard hits, Past the Groove, Fluid, The Message, release and numerous collaborations with some of the industry's top r&b contemporary jazz artists let's all welcome today lynn browntree <laughs> so good, boy, good. he good <laughs> so how are you doing today lynn i'm good i'm uh, i'm blessed i'm highly favored and i'm happy to be here thank you uh, to anybody that wants to listen to me talk, and I appreciate that. I don't take it for granted. Oh, wonderful. Well, it's good to have you, and let's dive right in. I do want to start off by getting a little bit of your background, where you're from, schools you attended. Could you tell us a little bit about that? I uh, was born in New York City, uh, but didn't live there long. We were only there for five years or so. And then my dad, who was uh, in the government, uh, ended up moving us down to Washington, D.C., uh, and uh, that's where I would, well, the extent of two years where we had to move out to Seattle, Washington, and came back to D.C. I finished uh, high school in Northern Virginia at Hayfield Secondary School. I did take some classes and some, attend some uh, a lot of seminars and, and uh, things over at the Duke Ellington School of Performing Arts in D.C. and a couple of program, music programs over there. And it was privy to a lot of uh, a lot of people who go on, who go on to be legends in, you know, in, 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 uh, in, in this industry. Um, but, uh, you know, very, very rich in music because of my background uh, with my family. Nobody particularly played the trumpet, but my my great grandmother. Um, and, uh, you know, funny story why I picked up the trumpet is in, in elementary school. Uh, my dad had my my his mother, my grandmother uh, passed away when he was uh, just a boy. But she left him a cornet that she used to play in, in her marching band. Uh, and uh, that cornet used to be on the mantelpiece in our house. You know, you all back in the, I kind of date myself. I grew up in the 70s. You had that house, that little white room that your family said with the with the, with the plastic on the um, chairs and everything. Now you yeah. go anywhere in the house, but that room, you got to <laughs> stay out of that. You can go in that room, but don't don't touch nothing in that room. And so that's, that's that when my dad was the original Jedi master because he put that trumpet on the mantelpiece in that room. And he said, yeah, you can walk around, but don't touch that trumpet. And every day I used to walk by and I, that'd be burning a hole in my head. Like, oh, I want to touch that trumpet so bad. So one day that they were out of something, doing something. And I, I went in there and I just touched it. And I, I looked at it. I tried to play it a little bit, put it back. He had rigged it so he could tell if it was moved or not and came home and said, now, nah, son, you, you know, you got to tell me the truth. He, and I said, yeah, dad, I'm sorry. And I, he's like, well, you know, it's, that's, that's fine. He's like, but your penance is you got to play it now. Mm -hmm. Now you got to play it. Not, not this one. I'm going to go get you one of them little cheap Bundys and you can play it. You can sign, sign you up. So the next day he signed me up. Uh, I had to sign up for uh, for school band and uh, uh, I got me a little uh, rental Bundy trumpet. And, and that was the beginning of me playing the trumpet. So um, I finished, uh, finished uh, high school in the band and, and I applied to schools all over the country and Florida A&M was, was was one of the schools that I was the schools that I chose because of the marching band and because they had a great business program and I had aspired to do both. Which again, this is a theme that will follow me throughout my career to to now, uh, business and music. And um, and uh, I, I I started at Florida A&M. And upon graduation, my dad gave me that trumpet and said, "Hey, you know, this is yours now. Put it on your mantelpiece. And uh, if you uh, when you get an opportunity, um, pass it down." Try to pass it to my daughter. She don't want nothing to do with it. She like that. You, you don't try that <laughs> Jedi mind stuff. I don't want to. You be spitting and you loud all day, and I can't sleep. Uh, I'm not messing with that. So it, it it didn't really work. But I still have the trumpet on my mantelpiece. So it's 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 a beautiful thing. But yeah, and I went to Florida A&M University, and uh, from there it just continued my music. Uh, just continued to uh, evolve and develop. And you know, marching in the band down there really really uh, helped me learn how to uh, what I say prepare practice. 
and uh, and perform. And, you know, because you, you had to do all three at the same time uh, at Florida A&M University and that marching bands back in the day when uh, when they weren't they weren't easy on the freshmen at all. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so per se, I, I know we're live. We can't say much about what happened, but it wasn't easy. Let's put it, let's put it that way. But it did teach me some lifelong lessons that I take to this day. Graduated from Florida A&M and Ooh, started 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 another pro- progression. What did you say now? <laughs> I said, woohoo, HBCU love. HBCU, Florida now. <laughs> oh, oh, that's wonderful. I love that. All righty. So you answered some of the second question. What I had written down was when and how did you first get into music? So you gave us yeah. wonderful yeah. explanation of that. Just curious, can you explain to us what a cornet is? Because I'm not too familiar. And I think some of our audience probably could use a... It's basically a, a more condensed trumpet. It actually is wound uh, as tight as a trumpet in terms of the bell and at times of the tubing on the cornet, but it gives a more um, more condensed, mellow sound. But it's played and pitched exactly like a B flat trumpet. Uh, it's just a little smaller. Ah, that's so cool. Thank you. Learn something new yeah. today. Yeah, yeah. A lot of the people play cornets and you know, they, they, they get certain sounds out of the cornet uh that, that are they're a little more mellow, I guess. Um, some cats find it easier to play, but the mainstay is pretty much the trumpet. All righty. Thank you. In your music, who would you say, you know, because you've you've lived um, in some like culturally rich areas, I would say from, you know, New York, D.C., Chocolate City. Can you tell me who are some of your your biggest music influences? Man, um, on trumpet is certainly uh, there's a there's a litany of great trumpet players. Trumpet players are at the top of the food chain in terms of jazz musicians. I mean, he starts with Louis Armstrong. Everything starts with him. I mean, but, you know, in terms of who I really gravitated towards, and that was Miles Davis. Um, and because I think Miles Davis, he, he, he had his foot in a lot of different genres of music, obviously started with the best when he was in the band with Charlie Parker, the music director for Charlie Parker, Bird Parker. I mean, come on. And then he he progressed and helped help change and create different sounds in jazz within jazz, and then took us into electric music. And his uh, his 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 music and his um, his songwriting is and his philosophy and music was always forward thinking forward. Um, so a lot of great people come from his bands, and he spans so many generations. I mean, you know, you get Charlie Parker and that whole scene all the way up to Marcus Miller, who's still kicking it today, running around. And Herbie Hancock, these are all. Uh, Miles Davis' disciples, John John Coltrane, Cannon Boy Adderley, who actually graduated from Florida and m as well and was uh, one of the instructors down there. So, I mean, he, he just touched so much. And then the, the sound of his horn, um, he was less prolific in, in terms of being a trumpet player. A lot of trumpet players like to be muscular. They like to, 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 to do a lot of acrobatic things on the horn and really, really hit the horn hard. And there's, there's a place for that, definitely. I mean, it's dope, sweet. A lot of the guys, I love it. I love the Freddie Hubbards. I love the the Lee Morgans. I love those guys, man. But but Miles, he showed you the sound of the horn and the tone of the horn, and the, the sound that you could get from that horn, uh, yeah. which is 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 second to none. You put that horn up against anything, any all these saxophone players out here, and you can't beat the sound of that horn like that. And Miles used to get. So he was an influence. Quincy Jones for for his production for the same reason. He, people don't know he was a trumpet player too. Play with Chris Clifford Brown uh, overseas and, 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 and in certain bands. So, but uh, you know, Cliff, uh, Quincy was was an, it was an influence for me. I'm a hip hop kid, and I came up at the beginning of hip hop, man. When it all got started, I was pretty much on the East Coast, DC, Frank Ski, and I used to listen to the radio, so I was right there with hip hop. And then when Neo Soul came in, I was done. That was it. That was for me. I said, man, D- <laughs> D'Angelo came out. Uh, yep. uh, Erica Badu came out. I was right there in all of that, man. And and I saw the, the evolution of hip hop from the beginning all the way to where it is now. And so, again, I, I infuse all of that in my music. And so you hear a lot of that in my music gospel. You hear reggae. Bob Marley is one of my favorite all time artists as well. Um, the, the sound that he got, uh, the messages that he put in his music and the so nothing, nobody has ever been able to create anything that sounds like Bob Marley. You know Bob Marley, and it's mm-hmm. timeless. 
So again, those, those are the type of influences that 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 make me who I am today. Oh my God, that's incredible! It, like it, it literally covers so many different genres. Hancock to you just mentioned Bob Marley. So I love it's just so well versed and well rounded. It makes me want to listen to your music even more so because it's just oh, like wow, you. like you. you have all these influences. Just you know, kind of like it's like baking, creating yeah. this beautiful. Yeah. Gin, so I mean, it's it's good. Music. Music. I mean, good music. I mean, I, I listened to when Nirvana came out. I love everything they did, man. I was on, I was mad when Kurt Cobain left us so early. And uh, I mean, just the Metallica. I love the Metallica Black Albums, one of my favorite albums. Tom Petty. So I got a lot of influences. I mean, I, you, I can go down the list. You hear see a lot of stuff in my in my in my playlists, man. Yeah, at least from my little musical background, I would think that's what makes a great artist when you're able to appreciate others' music. Good music is good music. Terrible music is terrible music. Oh, but even, ter- even terrible music is maybe good to somebody else. But you know, it, but <laughs> yeah, but- <laughs> good, good music is good music to me. You know, if if I just I love beautiful melodies. I love. And people think you know I'm the soul trumpeter. I'm you know I'm funky. Yeah, I love that funk. I love to get down. But put me somewhere and and I'm listening to some Steely Dan and uh, mm-hmm. I'm listening to something, you know, something real mellow. Uh, I, I love a good melody, a good, nice, strong melody. I always put one of those songs on the back of all my albums. So so the last song on, on my albums or the last few songs on my albums are usually, um, you know, a lot of space, uh, a lot of rich, deep chords and and just uh, just the the beauty, the melodies of of the horn, I like to bring out, particularly on those last songs and the albums on my albums. Oh my gosh, that sounds like a delicious dessert that I've been waiting for. It. <laughs> That's what it literally sounds like. So yeah. this is super exciting. <laughs> well, I'm glad I already ate because I'd be hungry again. I'm, yes. I'm I'm not a small I'm not a small guy, but you know <laughs> I've been to, been to the gym lately. But shoot, man, I get hungry. I'm glad I already ate. I hear you. Oh my gosh. Question. It sounds like I'm going to take a wild guess and say, yes, you write your own music, but I want to ask you, do you write your own music? Yeah, I write a lot of my own music. Um, Having eight CDs, I mean, you're talking about, you know, a minimum of 10 songs a CD. So you're looking at upwards 90 to 100 songs over the last few years that I've actually recorded on my stuff. And then I've written and produced for other people. Uh, and then, you know, there are songs that I've written that, that haven't even made the album. So they're just all in the phone. Um, but my last three or four albums, I started really, particularly this last album or last two albums, I started really collaborating a lot more because, you know, again, when you start writing and you start, you, you're you, you have a footprint, you have a fingerprint and stuff starts to sound the same to me. You know what I mean? And I can't, I, I want to be inspired and so that's where the collaborations come in. And so the the dynamic between me being able to write, but me also understanding that, you know, somebody else can come in and see a song a different way and add some more value to it. And then we can meet in the middle and just get the best of both because we have that ear where producers were songwriters. It makes the most out of the song and the music. And so that's what you'll hear a lot on my latest CDs is a lot of collaborations between a lot of great producers, you know, from Michael Broning to uh, Chris Big Dog Davis, my original producer who, who we collaborated on. He turned one of my original, my first song I ever wrote in my life was Every Day. And he turned that song into a gym. Mr. Dana Davis and Billy Meadow that I worked with, my first, very first project. Uh, in, in addition to all of the others, Demetrius and Neighbors is a guy who just, you know, I collaborate with who's here. So, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of great musicians and producers that uh, Brandon Williams uh, great guy um, that I love to work with and, you know, that are like minded and and together we create even better uh, music and better songs. Oh, my gosh, that's amazing. Just curious with all of these different views coming in and like everybody has their like they hear music differently. How does that work? How is the songwriting process for you when you're writing on your own as opposed to when you're writing with someone? Well, I mean, when you first start writing and you're you you got a blank canvas, then you know everything's new to you. But like I said, after you've written so many songs, you know you start looking for more inspiration, and and you know you're I'm sitting here in my studio and I sit here for hours, like, all right, what am I what am I gonna do? So sometimes you hear a melody and you you put it down and you don't like it, you scrap it. But when another producer comes in 
you know, I, I'll call up Michael Browning, and I've been about ready to make that call again. I know we just came out with a CD uh, in June, but this is when we first start going. You know, get a year a year in advance. Hey, man, what you got? You know, let me listen to some things that you've been working on. And they may send you a, a track, right? You put a melody to the track, or in a lot of cases, you have a track. I've had tracks that I've I've produced and have had sitting in my vault for years, literally years. And I said, I can't come up with a melody that I like on this thing, man. You send it over to the other guy or send it over to Mike or send it to somebody else. And they come back with this beautiful melody that just fits everything that you never thought of. You had to, but you created the song. You wrote the song and, and uh, produced the song. You just can't come up with the melody. So those are the type of things that, that you know, that when we collaborate, we, we go through. Or sometimes, I, you know, I just got to the point where, look, look, man, just produce me. Give me two songs and produce me, you know. <laughs> and you tell me what the melody is. You come up with the song. You tell me what the melody is. If I play something that's, that's, that sounds like trash, let me know. Tell me to do it again, or or even just you know map out the the melody for me, and I'll play what you what you've written. I mean, I, I'm because I've written so so much and I produce so much. I'm very sound in that, knowing that I can you know. And then again, it's gonna be my flavor when I play it or when I replay a melody. And people don't understand that's done a lot. A lot of a lot of artists that that's they're, they're like there's not much that Whitney Houston ever wrote. She was well produced and she had great melodies and she interpreted those melodies to where the person that wrote it could never even think it would go or sound like. And then she they made it her song. So a lot of artists do that. They they're they're and then but again it's hard to be to produce some somebody sometimes, you know. They won't listen. They don't do it that my way. But again, I know enough to know that if I'm coming to you to get a song and I want you to produce me, I want you to let me know good, not good, bad, terrible. You need to do this. Go here do that. Or oh, I like that. And so, again, that's how the process works with us. And it could start with a melody, start with a groove. We could start with my, my rest in peace. My, my, my bass player, Kenny Mack, uh, used to send me all these bass grooves, man. I was like, oh, man, I love it, man. Let's put a song on this groove, you know, something like they break out. And how many times you've heard, have you heard people breaking out a sound check? Let's go. Mm -hmm. I don't want to play. The, we don't want to play a song because there's some people that might be in the show kind of what they open the door. So people kind of milling around. We still got to get a sound check. Let's break a groove. We back. I was like, man, we need to record this. And that's why everybody get out there. They get out there recorders. Like, hey, man, record. Back in the studio a week later, we got a whole song from sound check. Oh my! What are we gonna God. call the song? What are we gonna call the song? Close the doors. It's too old, too early. You know. So, but yeah, now that's how stuff works. And, and musicians, we love that type of stuff. That sounds like heaven on earth. <laughs> <laughs> musicians, we, we are. It's an uh, interesting, uh, interesting bunch of uh, characters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hear you there. I hear you there. But that's amazing. The process is just literally you're taking nothing and creating something just just immaculate, just wonderful. Oh my God. It, it, you just said a mouthful because for me, and when I get philosophical and I get into my little spirit realm, it's, I'm just like, the first time I heard you know, my music on the radio or you get a message from somebody in Australia or China, it says, I listen to your music. You're like, I, little old me, I sat down here and I, you know, ding, 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 made my little old song and, you know, just put it out there. And somebody in China is listening to this. This is bless somebody's spirit in China. Bless somebody's spirit in Australia. Bless somebody's spirit in Africa. There's a lot of Africans reach. I mean, we love your music. You know, oh my God. And you never even think about that. You're like, gee, my little old, and I'm sitting down, I'm just regular laying in my basement, you know, eating some, <laughs> eating some chicken and, and trying to write some songs. No, mm -hmm. not throwing, throwing the food, right? I just, I ate. Yeah. But, um, I'm, you know, I'm just little old me and this person, all these people around the world are listening to my music and they're enjoying my music and they're thinking I'm this big star and I, I, I have to be, you know, I'm, I'm this great person. But in yourself, I'm just lean. But these people are being blessed by my music. That's such a, a overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly awesome feeling. If you can, if you can make sense of that. It, sometimes it can be overwhelming. You're like, oh my god! So some people, some musicians get scared of it because they don't know how big they are. And when they get in front of all the people and the people love them to death, they get nervous and scared because now you have to live up to who you, who these people think you are because you've written something that that's so special to them. And music is special to people, man. Music really means a lot to people. And and yeah. so again, that 
that you just said a mouthful when you said that little old me making these little songs, these melodies, playing this little trumpet, blessing somebody's soul somewhere thousands of miles away is just still, I don't take that for granted. Yeah, I think it's a gift first to be able to produce that type of music and sitting down and being a part of the, the writing process and coming up with those melodies like that in and of itself is a gift. And then when you're able to kind of like touch other people with that and in right. all parts of the world, it really... <laughs> I'm just thinking about if someone were to hear my record, it would be surreal. Like, surreal. It's a surreal feeling. I mean, when I hear myself on the radio, I'm like riding down the street. I'm just like that I, every time. And I've heard myself on the radio a lot. But mm -hmm. I'm just like, you remember that scene? And uh, what was that scene? Uh, the Five Heartbeats where they were in the bed and, and uh, they heard the song and everybody woke up. You on the radio? You on the radio? That's how you feel every time. Every time you you hear yourself on the radio, like, oh, hey, oh, it's me. And, and now all my family's like, yeah, you know, you're on the radio all the time. No, but no, I'm really on the radio. I'm going to record this, you know? So mm -hmm. it's just, it's that feeling, man. It's like, I cannot believe this, man. Yeah. And I was sitting down in my little basement writing a song. And now mm -hmm. thousands of people are hearing it. Yeah. Thinking I'm, hey, Lynn Roundtree, man. He, hey, man, Lynn Roundtree. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Now, now I got to get an outfit. Now I got to get my hair right. I got to make sure, you know, as, you I get bigger, as you get a little bigger, you got, hey, run yeah. to the airport. You can't just be all, scru all scruffly. You know, I got to get <laughs> shaved going through the airport. I went to the airport the other day. Somebody just jumped out of me. Man, I'm like, what? what? You know, hey, I don't know. You're walking through and blah, blah, blah. Is that another? Let's take a picture. I'm like, you know, I'm like, man, I'm glad I got a haircut. So yeah. it's like, <laughs> it's, it's a surreal feeling. I mean, you know, and yeah. smooth jazz, we're not like, huge superstars where you know you got to walk through with an entourage on stuff because we're we're instrumentalists people don't really see us they don't know us but you know you'll see some of them diehard fans they know who you are like mm -hmm. you know i know who you are <laughs> so again you better i be acting right i can't be yelling and acting crazy in public i'm like no <laughs> can't do that no more i can't be i can't be barking and stepping and stuff in, pu in public you know who's yeah. that crazy cute, cute dog damn a cute dog days are done I, you know i see i do that in there <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah, I, I, I get what you're saying there. I really do. Sometimes you gotta hold back just a little bit, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. alrighty. So I did just get a text. Um and it's a question for you. Um and you don't have to answer if you don't want, but are you married or do you have any kids? I am married and I have a daughter who's fourteen going on twenty two. She's in that um <laughs> I don't know if she likes me anymore stage, you know what I mean? And yeah. She used to love me. She's my little special daughter, uh, yeah. a child, and now she's like, get away from me. But no, I know she loves me. So, um, But yeah, she's uh, she's 14, and I am married, happily married to my wife, Yolanda, for now, she'll be mad at me, 18 years. Oh, wow. That's so beautiful. Go on tour. You know, how is it balancing that home? It has its challenges. It definitely does, um, you know, but... At being in the game so long, um, the part of being able to persevere in this is uh, is just what you said, being able to manage that family that, you know, that especially the musician's lifestyle where we're always out, we're in the public eye, there's, you know, there's late nights, there's uh, there's a whole lot of people and stuff going on, a lot of women around and all the other stuff. And so it took a minute uh, in the relationship for for us to figure out a pattern um and and to try and work things out to where um we were constructive uh together and we understood that you know our eyes on this music uh it's not on this other stuff that goes on and um and i think my wife comes out with me on now um a good portion of my shows you know she didn't come on all of them but she comes with a good portion of my shows we support each other she's got a, a foundation um she's a she's a trained dancer and she's got a, a foundation in here. It's called El, El Olam Cares, and it, it's a it's a it's it's spiritually based, and it we help find resources for you know young people, mainly young young girls, to uh, to be able to take dance and have dance in their lives because a lot of the programs have, aren't aren't in schools anymore. And she was kind of saved by a program like that in her school. And she's kind of evolved, and so you know really really I, I I support that. She supports me, and I think. It's through us supporting each other's endeavors and moving in that direction, it's made us and our relationship stronger. And so I think a lot of musicians have to go through that period, you know, a, a lot of particularly because she, my wife has been there from the very beginning. 
but I know there's some musicians who who meet their mates on the way, and it's just a, a tough situation they've got to deal with trying to understand a musician's life. Um, because a part of it is we put so much energy and emotion into our music um, that taps into the same energy source that y you would be using to put into your marriage, your wife, your your family. And mm -hmm. so you kind of tap into that. So it almost feels like you're shortchanging me for the music. And it's that same feeling as if you were, weren't paying attention or if you were off doing something else with somebody else kind of creeps in. And so you have to kind of reconcile that as well and, and, and learn, learn different things to, uh, to, kind of, to kind of balance that out to where it's, it, you know, feeling isn't there and, and this complete understanding of where, where, where you guys are headed, what direction you guys are headed in, in your relationship with the family. Thank you for that. I know sometimes those can be touchy subjects, but I love the way you put that. I think that a lot of times in media, some of the negative, yeah, I would say negative sides of having a family, especially in the spotlight, can wear down on a unit. But when you are able to be constructive, like you were saying, work together to find a happy medium, that rock on because the rest of us. Yeah, no, yeah. Well, it's, I mean, like I said, it's, it's not, it's not easy, you know, to travel yeah. and, and all of that, and and you're always gone and this that. It's just it, it's stuff creeps in and you know you, you make mistakes um nobody i'm not perfect and so i mean it's it's it, so it's a lot of reconciliation a lot of forgiveness a lot of uh mm -hmm. a, a lot of uh soul searching that you have to do so it's you know again it's but it's it's what a lot of people have to go through even not just musicians it's just you know i don't know when i tell you, even young people getting married and you know hey you you guys you know, yeah, i love you yeah i love you that ain't enough <laughs> hey, no. yeah. Hey, yeah, okay. You got to, we got to put, you got a little bit. You got to yeah. work. You got to yeah. work. And you have to actively work and you can't, it can't be passive about it. The love is not going to get you through everything. Yeah, it ain't that the truth. <laughs> <laughs> I see, I see you looking like, yeah, yeah, ain't that. Everyone's look, we are human. So, yeah. we, all, we all have our, our challenges. So, <laughs> yes, sir. We're able to give us an update of some of the projects that you're working on. Can you give us a rundown of that? Again, um, this is my latest project. This is The Message, my eighth CD, obviously. Um, and uh, we just released back in June. So uh, we did uh, we, we did a... Normally you want to come out with the lead single first, but we did a lead single uh, probably. We just wanted to hit the beginning of the year or so. Uh, we came up with the second CD in advance of the, the CD release. Uh, so essentially, we're just still kind of on the first release now. Um, so we're probably going to release three, two to three more uh, singles, I would say. I'm, I'm talking my label. Hey, man, you got, some, you got some hits on there. You need to keep releasing that. Uh, shout out to Trippin' the Rhythm Records, uh, who I've been with these last five CDs. Um, you know, one, one, one of the best, uh, one of the top smooth jazz uh, labels out there, contemporary jazz labels out there. And I'm just blessed to be a part of it. And, and they give me the support and the freedom to, to create and, uh, and the resources to, to do so as well. So shout out to Jeff Lunt and, uh, and uh, Les um, Cutmore for, um, for, for having me, a bit, for welcoming me into the family, Triple Rhythm Records family. But yeah, I'm, I'm working on, I'm always working on projects. I have collaborated with over a hundred different artists. I've recorded with over a hundred different artists published work um and so i am proud to say that most of it uh, most of it's great most good good great music and uh so i'm always in the process of collaborating with somebody uh shout out to adrian crutchfield he's the next guy up up, up, up in the studio i'll put him his song up in the studio we're about to collaborate on a tune um uh i just did the dave cause cruise this past uh uh past may and uh, there was a lot of great um, uh, conversations with other musicians. The greatest part of the being on the cruise, being captured for three weeks with other musicians is that, you know, you talk about things like collaboration. So, you know, mm -hmm. certainly we've got a lot of stuff coming out of those collaborations with some, some, some of the cats. Um, I'm working on setting up some tours, some some combo tours with different, uh, different artists. Um, I'm working with, um, obviously, Marcus Anderson and Julian Vaughn. Uh, bassist Julian Vaughn, Mark Anderson, great saxophone player. We're going to do some. We teamed up to uh, to do some things. Um, collaborating with Nicholas Cole and 
and my man, Mr. Nathan Mitchell, who's uh, who's really on fire now. You probably should get him on next. Um, um, and Nathan, man, he and I go way back, but now he's coming into his own with his solo stuff, man. He's really, uh, really doing well. So we're collaborating. So again, this collaboration is, is about, and then, you know, with Cat Eddie Stokes, man, a great producer out of Atlanta who just hit number one with a song that he, he wrote uh, and produced for, uh, for Algebra. And, uh, um, and then, you know, she's, on my latest project. And then we have a, a single out together that's, that came out. It's called All My Black. Um, it was a, it's kind of a, a song that was born out of the, 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 the George Floyd protests 2020 and, and all of the frustrations that uh, we as African Americans had with the, the, the criminal justice system. Uh, so we, we, we created that song and we collaborated on that first. And then I was blessed enough to have her and Eddie Stokes and uh, the machine uh, on my uh, James Dane and on my, uh, on my latest album. So yeah, there's some future collaborations with, with them. So yeah, I, you know, we're always working. I'm always moving forward. Always writing song. I got my little quarter and I, hey, man, I love that melody. I'm gonna put that down, get it in the studio and get the juices going again. So Awesome. Oh, my gosh. That sounds like super busy, but super fun all at the yeah. same time. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, it takes it so for us, like, I get to get locked back into the studio. It's like when you when you make a CD, you're like, whew, I'm done because I sit down here for hours and hours and hours and hours in this chair right here with this microphone, this screen staring and, and putting songs together. And I'm up till four in the morning trying to get stuff right and you know, mix, you know, do, doing all this, all the production and all of that. And so you just kind of get burnt out after the CD and you're like, geez, man, now I can woo up. But then it takes a minute and you get back into it. You're like, okay, because you know, when you get locked in, you're going to get boom locked in. So I, I got something to record this weekend and I know it's probably going to take me a minute. I'll sit on the couch, watch a game and I look over here at the studio and I, I'll watch the game some more and look at the studio. And then I'm like, you know what, let me get on up at 12 o'clock at night when everything's quiet and start working on the track. And then I get all hyped up and I turn around at four o'clock in the morning. I'm like, geez. So that's how, that's how it goes. All right. Well, speaking of collaboration <laughs> and new music, um, we're going to play for our audience now and for our own ears, the message featuring Gary Johnson. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Title track to the latest CD. <laughs>
Alrighty. So that was, again, the message by Gary Johnson. Can you tell us a little bit about the brainstorming process for that song? Well, that is interesting you ask. So the message is a, it, it's one, one of the things that having eight CDs, uh, being blessed to be, you know, in this industry for eight CDs, a lot of people give up early, is uh, being able to remake your own songs. And so that song was a song from the first album, uh, which is actually a vocal tune featuring Miss Leslie Nelson. Um, and uh, uh, I, I, it was such a great song. I mean, it, so I got the inspiration because I was scrolling Facebook, <clears throat> was in the process of putting my album together, trying to figure out what I'm going to do now, what I'm going to do different. And um, I, I came across the Steppers. Uh, no, I got tagged in a Steppers, uh, you know, some Chicago Steppers uh, video. I'm like, well, why, why am I tagged in the video? Um, and I didn't even look at it, listen to it. I just looked at it. You know how you looking through, scroll, you're driving or something. You're not supposed to be scrolling while you're driving. But <laughs> then I got home. I was like, I, let me see what this is about. And I listened to it. They were playing the message. And it happened to be from like two years before. And I'm like, two years ago? And somebody's just tagging me in this? Well, I, I went back. It had thousands of comments on it. Like, man, we we love it. But then the comments started, what, who, what song is that? Whose song is that? And people are like, I don't know. You know, it was just, I have no idea. And then finally, two years later, somebody tags me and said, this is Lynn Roundtree. I got this, this CD. And people are like, oh, my God, thank you. We love this song. And so I, it just reminded me how great of a song that was. One, two because it was my first CD, it didn't get the exposure um, that it, it it could have gotten, you know, had it come out now where I have a, some credibility in the name and presence. Um, but, you know, again, that song kind of, it was a great song and, and DJs, Steppers DJs know it, but no one really knows who it is. They probably had copied it, it was probably on somebody's, you know, disc somewhere with, with no name, just Steppers on it. So, you know <laughs> what I mean? And so I said, well, let me do it just as one, two, coming out of uh, COVID, and and now everything's out. I feel I, everything we're, we're back out, and we're blessed. Those of us who were still here to be here, I felt like now it was important. And so I got a message for people. You know, after you know seven albums in this business, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give them. This is a message, um, and, and every song on has, has is, is named after some sort of key point that uh, that I want people to, to to come away with, or feeling that I want people to come away with in this album. So I said, this is the appropriate time. This is you know, fortuitous because I'm trying to figure out what to name this, this CD. Let's just do a remake of the message and call the whole CD the message. And it was done. As soon as I, as soon as I said that, to me, it was, okay, now we're working on the message project. And um, my, my, my boy, Demetrius Neighbors, great producer, great individual artist as well. I mean, solo artist as well. Pianist extraordinaire. He's also my MD. Um, he's written hits for Kim and, and uh, has produced uh, a lot of people. Um, but he, we were finally able to collaborate on this. Uh, again, you know, because he was supposed to collaborate on the first album that he never made it on. And I keep saying, hey, man, let's collaborate. Eight albums later, finally, I got him. So we, I got him to, to reproduce this song and a couple other tunes that he did for for the album. All are, are, all are great. Uh, but then I got Gary Johnson, who's a guitar player who plays in my band. Um, and uh, he, he's so under understated. He does. He won't talk, you know, sometimes. He'll laugh every now and then. Um, but he, he'll show, but he shows up on time. He plays, but you would never know. He sounds like Van Halen on stage. You know, like, you know what I mean? But then you, <laughs> you talk to him, you can't get him to say two or three words. He'll smile at you and, and, and this. So I said, let me, let me give him some shine, man. Cause he just killed the guitar solo on this song. <laughs> That's what he does live. So I said, Hey man, I'm put you in lights, man. You probably not going to like it. Nah, man, you know, man. I'm gonna put you in light. So it's featuring Gary Johnson on, uh, on guitar. And that's how I came to you. It's a remake of, of my own tune. So it's a cover tune, really. But, uh, you know, so to, to be able to make a cover tune of your own first tune in and of itself was a blessing. Awesome. And we recorded, we, we did it. We did the track. We really kind of did it live. You know, I kind of did a dummy melody down, but, you know, they were live in the studio and uh, they, they recorded that thing live. We just kind of refined it um, a little bit, but that's how you hear it can't come out, you know, live. It's beautiful. I was over here. I was just like, okay, I can listen to this while I'm doing my, my homework, <laughs> anything. <laughs> well, so okay. now you imagine that on stage with a million speakers and us in, in some concert. So well, that's the next song that's going into the set because, uh, you know, obviously we got to, and you know, only have a 70 minutes or 90 minutes or 60 minutes to do a show. And I got so many songs, I had to figure out how to put the songs together. But that song is definitely going into the set. Nice. Well, it's definitely a keeper over here. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
All right. So speaking of pandemic music, we will listen to The Fluid as well, because I know that's one of your other ones. So, <laughs> well, fluent. yes, that is so. I love that. Like, it just really just lifts your spirit and just gets you, like, I was tapping my foot immediately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's just what you said because when we had, we, it was smack dab in the middle of the pandemic. We were in the basement. No, it was, it was and I like to tell this in, 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 in concert is like, uh, you know, we were all miserable. Everyone was miserable. And there was no toilet paper. Oh. I mean, there was Ooh. no toilet paper. Oh. Really? No Ooh. toilet paper? Oh. <laughs> out of everything that could, out of uh -uh. everything, that anything. That, why? We were already miserable. But there's no toilet paper. What is that? What was that about? That was the strangest thing. It did y'all okay. dirty. It did y'all dirty. <laughs> <laughs> no toilet paper, man. So in any case, but after after we got some toilet paper back, it wasn't charming. We started getting that little scratchy <laughs> stuff, but it was at least some toilet paper. I'm telling um, you. <laughs> once we got that straightened out, then we started writing music again. You know what I mean? You said. <laughs> <laughs> we started writing music again. So we um we we came up with this Michael again, I collaborated with Michael Broning on this tune. It's one of those tunes that you know, he said, hey, man, you know, I've worked with you. He had worked with me on a couple of tunes before that on, on Stronger Still. And uh, he said, man, I just I haven't been inspired, but something hit me and I've gotten inspired. And I thought of you and I just got into the studio, started writing, man. I I believe you're going to love this track. I was like, hey, man, send it to me. And uh, of course, my my Jeff Lund from the label, he gets to the he hears it first and he says, Hey man, I got I got this song for you, man. I got a, I was like, man, let me hear it. Of course, they waited a day to send it to me, so I'm all you know. I'm watching Marvel movies because that's all you could do during the pandemic is watch uh, <laughs> watch Disney, yeah. watch all the Star Wars stuff over again. So I, you know, they sent it to me the next day. I heard it. I was like, oh my god, that's because they knew it was by then. Michael had known um, my my vibe and my style, and because I had articulated, this is I, I like this. So I'm an R and B guy. I like this. And, you know, it, it just hit me hard. And uh, I put the melody, we put the melody together and and um, played through it. And it just, we didn't know what was going to happen because um, we made this and, and no one knew of the record, what was going on in the record industry. Should we put an album out? Should we just put something out? What, what, blah, blah, blah. We didn't know what was going on. We said, you know what? Let's just put this song out. 
Yeah. Let's, you know, because it feels good. Like you just said, it's a feel good song and people just need something to feel good. And they're getting back out now. They're starting to creep back out, have these little backyard parties and all this other stuff. And, you know, some people was, wouldn't run around no masks on these super spreader events. But we do look <laughs> just in your backyard and cook out and put some meat on the grill, you know. And put this song on, man, and it just it just makes you feel good. And and this became my second number one on the national Billboard charts, and it um, it stayed actually uh, on the charts twenty seven weeks, and it ended up being the number two most streamed contemporary jazz song of twenty twenty. And oh. so um, it was just it it, it just blew, blew my mind the reception that I got from the song. And so we I decided to, to name the name the whole song "Fluid." The whole the CD "Fluid." We're, like, we're going to name the whole uh, CD "Fluid." And yeah. so we didn't even come. We didn't release the album until about six or seven months afterwards. But that song set the tone for the album. You yeah. know, we're going to make this. That's that's what we feel. You know, we're going to do that. You know, we feel like that. And then so the second song we released was called "Release," and that went to number one too. So off with off of this album with some great songs on the album man I, I wish we could have released a couple other songs off the album but we just we were forward thinking and going, going to move on to another cd so well yeah that's sexy that's something to get, <laughs> get the candles lit us get the yeah. cuddle rug not that's too much don't, don't, don't put your head like okay that. come don't, on don't, don't, don't. <laughs> 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 all right so and I should, hold on shout out to my man uh, uh mel brown and freddie fox freddie fox played the guitar on that tune and mel brown played the bass mel brown out of out of uh arizona both these guys man you know mel brown is crazy on the bass man he just knows what to play how to play it he just knows the vibe and the feel and, and then you know by the time he puts his 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 taste and flavor on it you get freddie in there freddie brings it he brings it back to the street. He's like, oh, no, y'all got a little, little prissy over here with these tunes. I'm going to bring it back. You know, I'm, I'm going to get some street in it. But yeah, you know, we live stream, so I can't say what I want to say. But, yeah, he was like, you know what that means. So, yeah, I like the way he, that when he get on, when you get them two on there, man, it's going to be a hit. All I got to do is float over the metal melodies and not mess up. So It was her. <laughs> I, that is on my playlist. Thank I'm you, keeping dude. that. <laughs> it is good. It is great. Now, I do want to know if you have any upcoming shows for us. Got all this good yeah. music. We want to see you in person. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, I mean, you can go to my, everybody listening, go, go, go to my website, uh, lynnroucherymusic.com, and go to my tour schedule shows uh, as a tab. Um, we've got some great stuff still coming out. We'll be doing Jazz Legacy uh, down in Hampton, Virginia in uh, second week in November. Uh, that second whole weekend in November. And then um, I'll be playing the Florida Smooth Jazz weekend the first week in November uh, down in uh, Daytona. And uh, uh, got, uh, what do I got? A couple couple more good shows coming up. Uh, but, you know, next year starting to fill up as well. Uh, we're going to be out west. going to be down south. I'm going to be everywhere. So, you know, just stay tuned to stay attached to my schedule um, and uh, just make sure um, you sign up for my newsletter. You go on com. And I, I'll send out a regular newsletter to give you updates as to what I'm doing, what I'm releasing, what I'm working on, and where I'll be. All right. Lynn Roundtree Music, right? Dot com. Lynn Roundtree Music. Lynn Roundtree with no D. Music.com. Okay. All right, y'all. You heard it. I got it. Let's put it on our calendars. <laughs> For our last question, I want to ask you, for those who are working on this music stuff, it's not hitting like we feel it should be, or someone who just loves to sing or produce for other people, what is some good advice that you have for up-and-coming artists? Perseverance. That's the first one. This is not, I mean, I know you get a lot of the American Idols and you see you know, these one hit wonders and all that. Everybody wants to make it fast. TikTok sensation, blah, blah, blah. If you want to do anything in this music, the first thing you have to understand is that this is the long game. You got yep. a first and you you're gonna you're gonna hit a lot more pitfalls than you are um um successes and wins. So you have to understand that that, you know, this doesn't come quick. Few and far between it comes quick for. And the quicker it comes, the quicker it goes. You know, we like to say in the music business, here today, gone today. You know, the next day I'm on to the next flavor of the month. But those musicians who last um, have weathered the storms and that they've persevered. Um, so that's the first thing. Second, um, if you're a producer or a musician, you know, just listen and appreciate music. Some people go into music. I, I can't tell you how many musicians I know that 
when I told you my body of, of, of the volume of music that I listen to and enjoy and appreciate, some musicians don't, you know, they just kind of, well, I play this and, and that's it. And then they, they, they're they not as versed or as, as well. As stand and I'm not here to tell anybody what to listen to or who to listen to, but, you know, you, you should be an aficionado of music if you're going to be a musician. Um, mm-hmm. So make sure you listen. If you're getting into an industry, um, a genre, you know, listen, man, listen to see how that feel it, you know, get it in your bones, you know. Um, a lot of musicians don't listen. They just, they learn how to play the music and they just play, play, play and they try to make a song and, and then they wonder why nobody's paying attention or it listens because you haven't been listening. You don't appreciate the music. But now you're upset that, that people don't appreciate your music. And it shows. Music is emotional. It will show and it'll expose itself. Some people won't tell you they don't like it, but they're not dead, but they don't know why they like it. They like you. You put yourself into the music. So make sure you're um, yourself is together. So th- that's those. And then practice, you know, a lot of musicians, sometimes they, they stop practicing and they stop working on their craft, their art. They think they've made it. Well, yeah. again, there's some, somebody, you know, sitting on the corner that's looked like, yeah, you know, like, like, like a bench player talking about, put me in coach. He messing up, put me in. I got it. And they'll come in and they'll take your job. Um, so there's always somebody that's better than you sitting around. Um, and then the, the last thing to that is again, you're not going to be somebody else. So yeah, listen to, appreciate everybody else. Don't get down on yourself if you can't do what certain people do or you're not that type of person. You're in competition with yourself. You have to be the best version of yourself. That's the only thing you need to be concerned with. Yeah. Now, if yourself, if you're not where you need to be, is going to show. But nobody can be you. If you, When I made that decision, I can't be this trumpet player over here. I can't be that producer over there i can't be this musician i can't be I, even though i want to man they're so great i want to do everything they do when i made that decision to be the best land roundtree and make the best land roundtree music i can make is when i started to turn a corner you know i'm still still working progress always going to be a work in progress but you've got to be the best version of you you're competing with who you were that's who you're competing with and you got to keep on moving and every day you were something so you got to keep on competing with who you are, getting better, getting better. And the best version of you, everybody's got their own footprint. You're going to be different because of your footprint, because of your, your fingerprint. You're different, and your music's going to be different if you work on being the best version of you. Wow. I think that was like... <laughs> right there and i'm gonna take that with me and i hope the audience does too a lot of people get stuck up that's the hang up like oh well you know you got this person that's right shut everybody else out just shut everybody else out and focus on what you got to do and you will be successful so thank yep. you so i like a lot of musicians some musicians i see out here making music for other musicians well i want to sound sweet i'm gonna do this because this is going this is going everybody gonna be ooh, ooh, look how fast he played that Ooh, look what he did Ooh. <laughs> And them same musicians don't buy nothing. Mm-hmm. They, they, in fact, they listening to you to try and steal your chops and steal your licks. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah but they're not going to the store buying nothing. They ain't downloading nothing. They, <laughs> they getting, they trying to steal something off of the YouTube and, and you know, you get a lick. But they're not spreading your neck. They're not, they're not doing anything but saying, "Woo, he's sweet. He's sweet." <laughs> cater to your, cater to your fans, the people that love you. You know what I mean? Well, again, I really everybody, everybody wants to say, I want to do this and I want to be able to play because I want these musicians to be like, woo. You want your fans to be, woo. You want your fans to feel your music. So you, you make music for them. And if you don't have any fans and don't care about the fans, make music for you. But again, <laughs> you don't make music for other musicians. Yeah. I hear that. Well, I do want to thank you so much. It's so many gems were thrown our way today. Uh, so I want to thank you for your time and for your words um, and being a guest on our show today. Um, and I want to thank all of the audience here for tuning in on where are they now. And um, just so you know that we are in conjunction with Detroit Heart Radio uh, Television. Thank you, Kayla. Appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Andrea. Thank you. We love, we love you guys. Bid you a wonderful evening and I'll hopefully see you next week. Thank you guys. Thank you.